capacity is having to come the end of it. So the topic of my PhD is on frequency compression, which is a frequency lowering algorithm found in permanent human aid. So this is an overview of how it works. There's a cutoff frequency below which the input and output frequency is the same, just as the traditional hearing aid. Above the cutoff, a compression ratio is applied. And it means a wide input bandwidth frequency can be compressed into a narrower output range of frequencies, which is helpful if somebody's got very poor hearing in the high frequencies, or it helps um, because traditional hearing aids are not very good at delivering the high frequencies because of receiver limitations or to do with EMR tube and factors like that. It means that trying to provide amplification above 5 kilohertz would be quite difficult with a conventional hearing aid. So potentially frequency lowering could help people with a wide range of hearing losses. Now I've summarised the evidence of frequency lowering and this is a very simplified way to look at it but I just wanted to show you how hearing loss relates to benefit in these studies. So benefit is classed as um, significant improvements in one or more outcome measure. Um, now obviously there's big differences in these studies between the participants that are in them, there's adults, children um, of different ages, different types of um, Sort of duration of hearing loss and types of hearing loss and hearing aid experience and of course there's also a big difference in how people set the frequency compression so um, it could be that they use different prescription targets DSL or now and um, it could be that they set the cut off from the compression ratios to very different um, sort of parameters and as an example if you had somebody with a moderate hearing loss and they, that person was in a lot of these studies they would likely have different hearing aid settings so it makes it very difficult to um, combine the evidence if you like to see whether you can predict benefit from frequency compression based on hearing loss. I mean when you look at that it looks like there's more red, there's more profound in the no benefit category which when I did my lit review made me think well perhaps that group aren't, aren't going to get as much benefit. Um, there's only two studies that have looked within their results at whether there's a relationship between hearing loss and benefit and I'm just going to briefly tell you what they found. So the Glister study um, found that if you increase the average high frequency um, threshold, so the top one, they found benefit increase. So as you went from the red line to the blue line, benefit on their outcome measures increase. And the same at the bottom, as you went from the red to the blue line, benefit increase. So as kind of like they describe it as a drop-off frequency, as that sort of edge drop-off increases, people tended to get um, more benefit in their study. There was another study that I did here with an MSc student and Catherine Hopkins who's now left and we looked at, um, we had, there was a, a very big sample size so it was a good chance to look at how hearing threshold related to benefit and we did find a relationship but it was a negative one so um, as hearing threshold increased benefit reduced. Now one thing about the study was that it was done in clinic and it was using default settings of frequency compression so from previous work I've done looking at the settings it was apparent that the default settings didn't provide very much audibility to people who had severe to profound hearing loss. So we did an audibility measure within this study where we tried to measure how much audibility people gained from using frequency compression and that's shown in the bottom chart. So you can see that the people who did have a severe to profound hearing loss, they often had very limited amounts of audibility. Um, and this, this sort of idea of audibility has been explored further recently by um, Ryan McCreary and he's been looking at whether you can measure audibility um, with frequency compression and whether that relates in some way to performance on, um, on word recognition tasks. So he's, he's done a couple of papers but it's still in its infancy really. So when he, his method for measuring audibility was based on speech intelligibility index which um, is the traditional way that you might measure audibility with a hearing aid. The problem with frequency compression is that the input, the output frequency no longer equals the input frequency, so it doesn't make sense to use that. Um, now the only way he, he changed the protocol was that he, um, for, the, for the frequencies that have been shifted, he gave them the same importance function and all the same parameters as the input frequency, but he gave it the hearing threshold and the sensation level of the output frequency. So by shifting it down, people's hearing was better, therefore the sensation level was lower, therefore the audibility was a little bit higher. And he, and, and he shows a plot here of all his participants and how it related to, um, to the frequency compression, but you can see that there isn't really a relationship because they're all very homogenous, they all had very similar hearing losses and the settings were all set very, in a very similar way. Now I, I spoke to him because he was at the conference that I went to in America over the summer and he said that he had a lot of problems publishing this work because Although it accounted for the, for the frequency shift, it didn't account for the distortion that might be present due to the frequency shift. So um, he said it was, he had a lot of scepticism really about his approach, that perhaps it, it wasn't a valid way to measure audibility with a frequency compression. 
I'm going to talk more about mobility because I've used the approach that Catherine Hopkins used in that paper that we did, so I will talk about that more as the, as the um, talk goes on. So just a quick reminder of my study design then, it was a, a kind of an NBA you could describe it, where initially frequency compression was on, then it was off, and then it was, it was um, off and then on and then back off again. And it was with a second study, which I'm not going to talk about today, with the auditory training. Um, I didn't find a difference between the on periods, so I just, or the off periods, so I just averaged it to get an on and off score and just compared the results in that way. So with my entire group of participants, there were 21 in total. I tried to recruit as wide a range of hearing losses as possible. It was very difficult to recruit the mild losses that use um, binaural hearing aids regularly, because there aren't many, particularly in the NHS. It was very difficult to find the profound users because people weren't keen to change their hearing aid provision for the duration of the study, for the 16 weeks of the study. So it was difficult to get the two extremes. So initially I'm going to show you the analysis with the whole, with the group as a whole, because I think Although my research question was looking at is benefit related to hearing loss, well actually if you look at the first or the second slide there's a lot of studies that haven't shown benefit of frequency compression. So I thought well, the first step is actually to say does, does um, frequency compression provide benefit for the people in my study? And then I went on to look at um, if I split the group in two based on hearing loss, is there a difference between the groups and how they perform with the frequency compression? The split was based on um, the World Health Organization classification of hearing loss, and I chose 2 and 4 kilohertz because, if you recall from the first slide, the cutoff frequency is anywhere is around about 1.5 kilohertz. That's where it would be at its lowest. So most of the compressed signal is within this 2 to 4 kilohertz area. So um, I kind of theorise that that's where there might be that, that's quite an important area within the audiogram and the frequency compression hearing aids. So there's quite a lot on these, but I just wanted to give you the general idea, really. Um, for the phoneme detection, there was a phoneme test that I used that used um, a shut and a surf that were low in frequency. That was supposed to be a male voice, and a shut and a surf that were high in frequency, which was to represent a female voice. The first box chart here is the whole group as a whole. So the first set of results are for the whole group, and then it's split into mild to moderate, and then into the severe to profound. This is a detection threshold, so the lower is better. Um, blue is with it off, green is with it on. So you can see for the two shuff phonies there isn't really much difference between them. For the two surf phonies, um, frequency compression does result in a lower threshold, particularly for the S9, so um, supposedly a high frequent a female S sound. And that happens for all the groups. For the um, for the S sensitive at 6 kilohertz, it's only the severe to profound group that gets a significant effect of the frequency compression in terms of the detection task. They also did a recognition task with these phonemes, um, and this time the shift sensitive at 5 kilohertz did show an effect for the whole group, but that was just in the severe to profound group, not to split the groups up. Um, the same thing for the surf low and for the surf high, they all have an effect on the frequency compression. Um, I then went on to do a word recognition task because I wanted to see well if frequency compression improves, does it improve detection and recognition and then how does that relate to, to words? Um, I use a FAF test and I use a percent correct and a reaction time measure. Now for the full set of words, this didn't show any difference between the groups, um, whether it was group as a whole or the two separate hearing loss groups. I then went on to look at a, a subset of the words um, that contain more high frequency phonemes have a higher high frequency content, but again, it didn't show a difference between um, the conditions between on and off. I also did a sentence recognition test in noise, um, and that showed that when you consider the group as a whole, there was a significant effect with the frequency compression, and when you split it into groups, it was a severe to profound group that had um, the, the biggest effect. And I've, I've given you the mean at the end to show you what, what the change was. So it's a small change. Um, 0.97 dB for the severe to profound. So it, it, it's whether how much that would actually affect their day-to-day -day listening ability. And when I was thinking about this slide, I was thinking about a talk that somebody had a few weeks ago, Bill Whitmore, and he did a talk at the conference in America while I was there. And he described a meaningful change in the 6 dB change. It's obviously quite far away from that, but he did say that even a 1 to 2 dB change is noticeable, but it just, it just might not have a big impact um, on, on their behaviour and like on how they how they might describe the sound or perceive it, which is quite interesting when we look at the self-report. So the self-report, I used the Glasgow questionnaire, and um, they did it twice in the off condition, twice in the on condition, and they averaged the results because there's no difference between them. 
I looked at each individual question because I wasn't really sure which way I was expecting the effect to happen. I think that, so possibly for the female and child speaking, you might imagine that frequency compression might be beneficial for music, it might be detrimental. So I wanted to look at how each individual question. And you can see here that there wasn't a difference between the conditions in any of the questions, and there wasn't really a general trend towards um, any condition being higher at all either, which isn't, isn't novel. Uh, out of the studies I showed you earlier, there's five that use self-report measures of frequency compression. Three of them didn't find any benefit on any of the outcome measures, including the self-report, and two of them, um, one of them hasn't been published yet, but it was a PhD that was done here, and she found improvements in speech recognition that she didn't find in the self-report. And the other study, which was the Glister study, found um, that when they asked the children which one they preferred, so they tried it on a memory program, they could use frequency compression on and off, and at the end they were asked which one they preferred, the children did choose the frequency compression, and that did was backed up by their speech um, their speech test results. So that, that one did coincide, but it, it, it's not common, and self-report hasn't been used frequently with frequency compression. So I also asked them about whether they noticed the settings on the hearing aid change during the course of the study, and the reason I asked this was, um, so early on in the study, after four weeks, they have the frequency compression turned on. And this study is blind. They don't know that anything's been changed with the hearing aid. I just told them I was testing the hearing aid. And I was expecting, when I put it back on their ear, that there might be some comments, really. Some people saying, oh, what, what's happened? Or has anything changed? And I wasn't really sure how I was going to handle that. And actually, when I put it back on their ear, nobody said a word about, about the settings or about any change in sound at all. Um, so it made me think, well, maybe I need to just sort of ask them at the end of the study, do they do they think anything has happened before I've explained the format of the study or, um, or the fact that they have different settings. And over half of them said that they didn't notice that anything had changed during the study. And of the ones that did notice, um, so here's, for instance, it's a disability for brown group, you might expect more of them to have preferred frequency compression enabled in support of their speech test results, but they didn't, there was only one that preferred it enabled. Um, so, yeah, that's quite interesting. That's the self-report. So the second way I analyse the data was just to look at a correlation. So I've, I've got 21 people in my study. If I look at the scatter plot, how do, do hearing thresholds compare to benefit? And I chose two uh, sort of predictive variables for this, which is the hearing thresholds at two and four, which as I said before, is the area where the compression, kind of the output frequency of the compression, that's where the signal's compressed it, so I think that's quite important. And then I also looked at six to eight, because with a traditional hearing aid, that's the frequency area which isn't amplified very well. Um, and I only did this on outcomes that showed a significant group benefit. And the significant relationships were between the S sensitive at 6 kilohertz, which is representative of a female S, and that was significantly correlated with thresholds at 2 and 4 and thresholds at 6 and 8. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't a um, very strong correlation, you can see from the R value. And it looks to be a linear correlation. I haven't put a line through it because I use non-parametric tests for this because the data is non-parametric. It looks essentially linear. There's a few points further out um, where, where it has gone down a little bit. And it would have been nice to have had more people in the profound group so I could have seen whether, whether this was an actual drop-off. Because you might imagine that after a certain hearing loss, people might start to get difficulty in, in gaining benefit from this profession. But it appears to be a generally linear positive relationship. Um, the recognition threshold again was for the S6 and the shirt centre at 5 kilohertz. Again it's a positive relationship, generally linear except for this one down here. Um, but again quite a weak relationship on the predictive variable. So I then looked at this measure of audibility. So um, because the settings on frequency compression can be so variable <coughs> Um, it made me think, well, rather than using hearing loss as a predictor, maybe it would be better to use audibility as a predictor. Um, and this is why we, we did this with the MSC project. This is, this is why we did it. And the method we used to measure audibility was we used a Verifit, which has signals that are filtered around a specific frequency, so you can see them as they get shifted. And we um, assumed, using the, based on the long-term average speech spectrum, that speech has got plus or minus 15 dB range. And we looked at um, the audibility, so the level above the threshold at any frequency that was irrelevant when it was when the signals were off and when the signal when frequency compression was off and when frequency compression was on. So we did it for two signals, four and six. So in this example, 
full when it's um, off is the green. So you can see it's, it's above the threshold, the threshold is red and it's sensitive to 4 kilohertz. Full when it's on is the blue, so you can see that it's shifted down and you can see that it's still a little bit above threshold but it's not as above threshold as it was when it was off. And if you look at the six, it's a purple when it was off, so it was way below threshold, completely inaudible when it was off. When the frequency compression was on, it was the orange, so it, and, and we've measured that area there above threshold. So we were looking at the difference really between threshold and the peak in this in these signals. Um, we did only measure the, the peaks at these discrete frequencies two, three, four, and six because you can have a table format of this and it tells you the, the exact level. Um, so there is there is a chance that it might be sampled wrong. So for instance, in this example, if you look at the peak for four K when it's off, when it's on and it's been shifted down. The peak lies somewhere between three and four. So by sampling only at three and four, there's a chance you could miss that peak. So there is limitations in this method, as there is limitations in the method that, that Ryan McCreary used. And he also used the Verifit to look at the different discrete bands, and that's how he measured um, the shift. And he also measured at discrete frequencies in this way. Um, but it is a way of measuring the audibility of the signal and comparing off and on. So, uh, so I ended up with an improvement value, how much order, how much had the frequency compression improved audibility, so I just minus the off value from the on value, uh, on from off. And then I also looked at the standard absolute value of audibility. So first of all, I just wanted to see, well, how does this audibility relate to hearing thresholds? Um, so this shows you the audibility on and audibility off. And uh, as you would expect, as hearing threshold increases, the audibility decreases. That's to be expected. The gap between on and off is pretty similar all the way through, which is what I would expect, because the aim of my fitting procedure was to improve audibility with frequency compression, whatever their hearing threshold was. So all the way, so it does, it does narrow as they get to the higher um, hearing losses, but generally there's a, a gap that's similar all the way through. Now I think what's quite interesting is the values of audibility, the absolute values of audibility. So before I said I put a cap on it at plus or minus 15, but then we added the results from the 4 kilohertz signal and the 6 kilohertz signal. So actually the cap is plus or minus 30. So zero, the zero line le represents where the signal is exactly the same level as the hearing threshold. That's where you, the, the signal that we use is exactly the same level as the hearing threshold. So above that is where the signal is higher and below that is where the signal is lower. But the signal just represents a 65 dB sound and there is a range around that. So there's a range within um, the spectrum of speech that is, is higher than that and is lower than that. So for these people with a profound loss, when I looked at this benefit and, and how, it, how, it, how it looked with a profound hearing loss, I thought well, there's no way that they can get benefit because it's nowhere near their, their threshold. Actually, there's a range of sounds that is, is within the range where they could still hear something about that signal that might help them to get benefit from frequency compression. Um, and I think, I think that's possibly uh, quite important in terms of explaining my results as it was the severe to profound group that got most benefit from the frequency compression. So in terms of whether it was related to any of the outcome measures, audibility improvement was related to sensor recognition and noise. Um, but that was the only one that was related. So conclusions. Does frequency compression improve outcome compared to conventional amplification? It does in, in most of my outcome measures. Is, is benefit dependent on hearing loss? Benefit's much greater for people who've got a hearing loss of 6 dB or greater, between 2 and 4 kilohertz. Um, can you predict um, benefit based on hearing thresholds? Well, they are correlated, but I'm not sure that the correlation is strong enough to really use it as a predictive variable. Audibility improvement, can you predict benefit based on audibility, again the same really, there is a relationship but I'm not sure um, it could be used as a predictive variable. <coughs> Other general conclusions, the self-report in this study didn't agree with the speech test results. Um, frequency compression didn't dramatically alter the perception of sound as I might have expected or as it's, as it's reported a lot in literature and um, there didn't seem to be any type of acclimatisation to the frequency compression over the weeks suggested that maybe Plantization is a required frequency compression. I think future work would be, it would be good to look at this audibility issue, try and find a way of measuring audibility, so it could be standardised and it would be easy then to look at all the results from the different studies and actually see if there is a relationship between hearing loss and frequency compression. 
if frequency compression isn't changing their self-report about the hearing aid, then <coughs> is it actually changing their experience with the hearing aid in the real world? Um, maybe we've not got the right outcome measures, maybe the outcome measures haven't been used enough, maybe we need more people in the studies to get a, uh, to see an effect with, with questionnaires, I'm not sure. Um, does frequency compression degrade sound quality for hearing impaired individuals? Again, in the literature it's said that it does, but actually my study doesn't suggest it does. Um, and then this question of acclimatisation. Again, there aren't many studies that have looked at acclimatisation. There's two that I cited a lot. One of them looked at outcomes after six months, but there was no control group. The other one is just case studies um, that looked at how individuals how individuals change the frequency compression in between So that's it. Uh, question? So, Anne Marie, I was wondering, do you think there are generalizable things to take away from your PhD? Or do you think it's all tied in with this phonak frequency compression device? So, at the end of it, you say, Actually, there's not much benefit. <laughs> Apart from saying that, are there any generalizable things about frequency lowering hearing aids or hearing aid benefit that you think you're taking away from this? I think it's difficult to do that really because the different approaches to frequency lowering are so different and that, that makes it um, a bit frustrating in a way because you probably need the same research done with every type of frequency lowering algorithm to, to really see. I mean, there are studies now that are coming that have looked compared, say, the wide X1 and the phone at one, and it is being compared more. Hopefully that will improve it, but I don't think you could say, other than maybe the, the method of predicting audibility, mm -hmm. probably maybe try and find one that would be suitable for all the frequency lowering uh, approaches. But I'm not sure that because the people to so the people more severe to find lots of benefit, I don't, I don't think that would relate to any of the I, mean, I suppose the skills you're learning are transferable. Yeah, Clinical yeah. trials and the outcome measures and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, but, but I think the results are very specific to the phone uh -huh. What audiometric measures are you taking at screening? Is it just the audiogram or are you doing anything beyond it? Just the audiogram. Mm. Um, and just an <coughs> audiometry range as well. So in hindsight, maybe I could have looked at high frequencies. I think that's probably why I didn't see any relationship between the detection and recognition of the 9 kilohertz sound and the audiogram, because it's quite far removed, really, from where I've measured. Um, 